in Africa, 14 economies are controlled by the French still. The African franc is about as African as the Federal Reserve is federal. And when you look at the range of problems and you're like, my goodness, like, imagine if it was nearly impossible to send money from New York to New Jersey. How advanced would the United States yeah. be? It, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be anywhere. It would be a backwater hovel. That's what it'd be. So it's a miracle that Africans are even where they are, considering all the stuff they're going through right now. Because the thing about Africa, there's a lot of money there. You know, when we went there four years ago, we started telling everyone right away that, hey, Africa's going to lead global Bitcoin adoption. No question. Everyone laughed. They said, oh, come on. Africans make $2 a day. There's no way they're going to figure out Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. Now Africa is actually leading Bitcoin adoption, number of Google searches, and sheer number of peer-to-peer -peer transactions really? as well. Yes, this is happening right now. It was the peoples of Africa that taught us what the killer app of Bitcoin really was. And that is a universal translator for money with any two peer-to-peer -peer trades on a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. Any form of money can become any other form of money. Do me a favor, picture your favorite crypto app or exchange. Got it? Now I have five questions for you. Question number one, does your favorite app or exchange have fiat on and off ramps that do not charge you crazy fees? Question number two, does your app actually help you time your investments with machine learning and algorithms? Question number three, does your app or favorite exchange connect to multiple exchanges to get you best rates, best liquidity, but also mitigate the risk of a central failure of one single order book? Question number four, is your favorite app or exchange Swiss made, but also licensed and regulated in the EU so that you can feel 100% reassured, but also sleep well at night? Question number five, is your favorite app or exchange fully aligned with your principles and values, 100% community centric and not VC backed? So if your answer to any of these questions is a no, what are you waiting for? Download the Swissborg Wealth app, join the new era wealth management and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community blockchain boys across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonite season three finale with another amazing guest, the CEO of Paxful, co-founder Ray Youssef, a real bro, someone with, on a mission, you know, with tons of incredible insights. This is going to be so much fun, guys. A pleasure to have you, brother. How you doing? It's good to be here, brother. It's my pleasure and honor. Thank you for having me. Man, Ray, you're such a cool dude, man, and you've achieved so much. Paxful has been huge. But before jumping into Paxful, I'd love to hear your personal story, bro. You have an incredible background, you're mixed, and you've been all across the world. And tell me, tell me about yourself and your transition into the crypto space. <laughs> yeah, well, it all started in uh, Egypt when uh, two school teachers met. My mother and father had me, and my father went to America for the promise of a better life, you know, like all immigrants did. He was a science teacher, but his first job was a dishwasher <laughs> in New York City. And he scraped by enough to make enough to bring me, my mother and sister, my baby sister over. So I came to New York when I was two years old. You know, my whole family came for the promise of a better life. And it was hard growing up in New York in the 80s and 90s. It wasn't quite it was as rough, posh. Man. Yeah, it was really rough. I grew up in uh, Hell's Kitchen in Columbus Circle back then. There was no Jay-Z's penthouse back then, but it, it was a little different. <laughs> it was like roving crackhead central. But, you know, I worked in my parents' newsstand right in that area, right? So I learned how to do business, like on the street, talking to real people, really, really rough conditions. My first job was a paper boy. Paper boy in Columbus Circle is very different from the paper boy of the suburbs, my good man. I had to like put together the Sunday Times, load it on this huge handle truck. I was a big, fat eight-year-old kid. I would go around to every hotel there, deliver these papers, come back home with a thousand bucks at the end of the night in cash. That's a lot of money for an eight-year-old boy to be walking around in Crackhead Central 
My father gave me a knife ring to defend myself. <laughs> that was my first job, right? Oh, wow. So I learned about staying connected to the streets. I learned about talking to people, how important it was to understand the people that you're working with. And I got a lot, a lot of street smarts, right? And all that is invaluable to me, especially now, right? So here I am. I went to college in New York, majored in history, got my first computer at the age of 19. Real late, right? Started developing, built all these projects. My first startup was, uh, they called it the Napster of ringtones. Whoa. Yeah, it was right when Napster went yeah. down, I came out and I said, it was peer-to-peer, -peer, right? I did peer-to-peer -peer from the jump. I wow, got people to upload so ringtones cool. and I sent it to them automatically and I charged them $2.50 for that. <laughs> I was a one-man army and uh, the company went from zero to a million, multi-million dollar company within six months and I was doing the whole thing myself, developing, building, coding, everything. And then finally, uh, <laughs> I had enough of that. <laughs> And uh, I decided to, I bought my mother a house. And uh, Congratulations. I, was, I was happy with my that life. That must have been such an amazing moment to do. Yeah, that was my whole life. I, it was the best thing I ever did. And I uh, went traveling the world. After that, did mixed martial arts, boxing, went all, you know, had my kind of ashes time as a wandering gypsy. <laughs> I was so turned off from the music industry that I just had it cut away from all of tech for a while. You can imagine how arrogant these guys were right yeah. after they took down Napster, right? And here I was, I was like, hey guys, I got all of them in a room together. And I was like, hey, I'm getting you $2.50 for these little 20 second monophonic ringtones. They don't cut into your existing business and you can use them to publicize your songs. I'm gonna give you $2 out of every $2.50. Guess their response. They were like, mm, no. No way. It's against our business model was, in our model, we have to get paid every single time the ringtone goes off, not per download. <laughs> that was their answer. <laughs> Very rude what? awakening for me, right? But you know, they learned their lesson right now. So we're kind of in a similar dance right now with the regulators here in cryptocurrency land. You know, they're trying to you know protect their interests and we understand that and we're trying to build something new that's better for everyone. Yeah. So it's a similar experience. Hopefully we'll have better luck <laughs> than I had back then. I'm confident that we will. And uh, Paxful was started in uh, 2015. We just celebrated our 15 year anniversary, a uh, five year anniversary. And I, it all started when I met Artur Schabach, my co-founder. What a cool very guy. Amazing oh. guy. Really, he's a godsend. It's like Sylvester Stallone and Ivan Drago got together <laughs> yeah. and had a baby. <laughs> And it's called Paxful, right? <laughs> so I met him at my first Bitcoin meetup in the Bitcoin Center in New York City, run by Nick Spanos. And we were the only two tall guys there. So we just got along, apparently. And, uh, you know, we wined and dined each other for a few months and then started something which didn't work. It was a it was a failure. It was a retail POS for Bitcoin, for retail merchants. It didn't work because no one had Bitcoin at the time and merchants yeah, didn't want to go through yeah, using it. So we're solving the yeah. problem that simply did not exist. Too ahead of the curve, right? Exactly. So we ended up homeless, actually, yeah. Surfing couches, on and off homeless for about three months. We had to choose between a server and uh, a couch to surf on, so an apartment. So we chose a server, right? So it was really hard for us, but uh, one day a friend of mine came up to me and he's like, hey, Ray, you're not looking too well. Have you tried selling Bitcoins for gift cards? And I was like, no. And he's like, hey, you can get 50% back profit by selling Bitcoins for this particular type of gift card. I was like, man, this is a scam, bro. Yeah, Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> but I was desperate. I was in no position to be questioning anything. So I tried it. Magically, it worked. We scaled it up, got a place to live. And then we said, hey, let's build something around this for everyone. Gift cards are the best way to, to onboard the unbanked into Bitcoin. Because yeah, that was the main problem. Absolutely. People didn't have enough Bitcoin. And the reason me and my co-founder bonded was because we believe Bitcoin could actually help the little guy, the people that needed it most, you know, those people that everyone ignores. And we built it. And uh, sure enough, within a few months, we got a flood of mainstream users when uh, this one website lost its merchant account. And all of a sudden, these simple, you know, mainstream users started like coming to us. And I got this phone call on my cell phone. I had my cell phone number right on the website. No one ever called it until that day. This lady calls me up and she's yelling at me hysterically. I hear babies crying in the background. She's like, I'm down to my last $13 and I need this Biddy Coon. Biddy Con, she didn't know how to pronounce it. I was like, how did you get my number? She's like, I found it on the internet. She was just cursing and insulting me. She was 
It's like, you men are all the same and you won't even, I'm like, I was, I was, my first thing, like anyone would have hung up, but I was like, this person is in pain. They found my number. Let me see what their story is. Turns out she was surfing the web for up to eight hours trying to find some Bitcoin, but she couldn't buy any Bitcoin, but she had no bank account. This was an American lady from Louisiana, right? They didn't have a bank no account. Way. There's 40 million Americans that yeah, are unbanked and don't want to be banked. This is a huge population of people. They're considered an invisible population even in the United States. So I found, I finally figured out how to get her some Bitcoin. Um, I asked her if she could buy a gift card and she did. She bought a gift card, got onto our platform, walked her through every step of the way through her eyes on a crappy little, barely a smartphone, right? You can imagine the nightmare of trying to teach a non-techie person how to copy and paste a long, scary Bitcoin address on a mobile phone, right? But because of that, because we were connected to the streets, talking to the people, we completely re redid our entire platform to be, to be for actual human beings, not crypto nerds, not uber techies. And that's why we're here, because our values define our journey. And the first value is stay connected to the streets. That is so beautifully put. I don't even know what to ask you, Ray. I almost want to give you a round of applause for such a beautiful story. And, and thank you for opening up so much and sharing all these things. And for a kid who actually grew up in New York in the 80s, I can tell you one wrong alley. A friend of mine, this is a true story. The car went in one wrong alley in South Bronx, came out Ooh, three, Bronx. three shotgun holes. Ooh. One alley just had the time to, to do a reverse. There were bullet holes all across the freaking car, man. Like New York, for those who don't know, was super freaking dangerous. The crack phenomenon was was nuts. But I guess, you know, it's so cool that it kicked off in the streets. You know, you had that transition and then came back to the streets and you're you're really helping the people in need, right? Absolutely. Is that the beauty of your story right now? Or it rather is. than you said the geeks or, you know, people who are tech savvy and stuff like that. It is, but it's not about the technocrats. This is about people helping real people, especially the people who need it most. Essentially, we're in a crusade against financial apartheid. And you only understand what that is when you go to the emerging world like Africa, you know, go to Ghana, go to Nigeria, talk to the people there, ask them about their problems with money. If a merchant in, say, Nigeria or Ghana or, or um, almost any country in Africa wants to make a payment to the country next door, it'd be much easier for him to load up a cash full of money, a suitcase full of cash and just, you know, take a plane to the country next door. Right. Forget about sending money out of Africa. That's a nightmare. They'll have to buy, for example, they have to buy U.S. dollars in the black market, find a way to get the U.S. dollars to Europe or America, then to Hong Kong and then pay the guy in in uh, China. Or if you get on Paxful and sell some bitcoins for an Alipay payment and boom, the bill is paid. Yeah. Right. Essentially what we've done. And when I say we, I don't mean just the people at Paxful. I mean, our users, our customers is what we call them. They taught us everything, especially the peoples of Africa. We sat there and we watched them. I talk with them every day. I'm the, I'm the CEO of the company, but I do customer support every single day every on single Facebook, day. on that's WhatsApp, awesome, on Telegram, man. on Twitter, on Instagram. That is awesome. Everywhere, right? That because is... that's the only way you're going to see your product through your people's eyes. And this yeah. game is about product. There are very few product people in crypto. So news to everyone out there. Yes, there's some amazing, really amazingly brilliant people here in crypto, but it doesn't matter how brilliant you are. If you're not willing to bend the knee and listen to your customers, you're not going to get anywhere in this scene. Because people out there do need help. There is 4 billion humans out there that are in desperate need of financial services. And the reason we're successful, Paxful is 300 people, 300 employees around the world, completely bootstrapped. We didn't take a dime from anyone. The reason that is, is because we actually listen to our users, our customers, and we solve problems that actually exist. We're not afraid to talk to them. You know, you don't see, you don't see any, any other CEOs doing that, right? It's crazy, customer hope, support, and that's so cool, man. We're in the financial services business. Let's never yeah, forget that. services. The reason the banks, you know, the banks don't care about service, right? They own the biggest buildings in every city in the world. So they've got, you know, their noses up in the air. So we're going to win by being the exact opposite of that back to the roots and doing the opposite of what the, the big guys are doing. And, you know, you, I know you're flying constantly to Africa. Like, I'm sure you had so many breakthroughs and epiphanies while you were there and talking to the people. What moved you the most by trying to help the local people in need? Because, you know, we don't have the chance or to often go there and really see it from our own eyes. Right. So you must have seen some some crazy things and some really moving things while you were there. Absolutely. I'll give you some examples, but it's basically two things. And the first thing is the problems that people have there with money. You know, there's 2000 
financial networks in Africa. Only 3% of them talk to each other, right? If you're going to send money from one country to the country next door, it's a nightmare, even for corporations. You know, places like Nigeria and Egypt are money prisons. You cannot get money out of those countries. Ethiopia is the same. In, in Africa, 14 economies are controlled by the French still. The African franc is about as African as the Federal Reserve is federal. It's neo-colonialism and hardly anyone knows about it. And when you look at the range of problems and you're like, my goodness, like, how, imagine, if, imagine if it was nearly impossible to send money from New York to New Jersey. How advanced would the United States yeah. be? It, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be anywhere. It would be a backwater hovel. That's what it'd be. So it's a miracle that Africans are even where they are considering all the stuff they're going through right now. So the problems are huge. Some examples, for example, in Nigeria, if you get a debit card, you can spend money online with it, but they limit you to $100 a month total that you can spend online. Right. You can't even buy an Xbox like that. Right. The, the amount of problems, you can't imagine the, the financial limitations that people there have to go through. It's, it's absolutely insane. So that was the first thing, the problems that they had. Right? There was immense need for the financial services that Bitcoin could bring. And the second thing was just the natural resources of Africa. But by that, I don't mean what's in the ground. I mean what's in the heads and hearts of their young people. There are so many brilliant young people there, entrepreneurs, so ambitious, so driven. And all they're doing is looking for a path. You give them that path and you watch their eyes light up. You know, I did a campus tour with the entire team in uh, Africa last year. We went to eight different universities in uh, South Africa and Kenya. And I would talk to them about Bitcoin and peer-to-peer -peer finance. And it was really interesting because you get there up in front of a, like a huge auditorium full of a thousand you know, students and you mention Bitcoin, you see their eyes roll over oh. and you're like, what's going on? Everyone in Africa has been scammed or knows someone oh. that has been scammed involving Bitcoin. Multi-level marketing scams like OneCoin, all these MLM scams that came out of Russia, uh, crypto mining scams, all of which are a scam, right? And everyone else who's day traded, like 99% of those people lose money, right? So when you mention Bitcoin, that's what they think. Uh, but then I tell them, hold on a second. Bitcoin is not just a means of investments or, or speculation. It can be a means of exchange that will allow you to use the money that you have. Because the thing about Africa, is there's a lot of money there. You know, when we went there four years ago, we started telling everyone right away that, hey, Africa is going to lead global Bitcoin adoption. No question. Everyone laughed. They said, oh, come on, Africans make $2 a day. There's no way they're going to figure out Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. Now Africa is actually leading Bitcoin adoption, number of Google searches, and sheer number of peer-to-peer -peer transactions really? as well. Yes, this is happening right now. It was the me. peoples of Africa that taught us what the killer app of Bitcoin really was. And that is a universal translator for money with any two peer-to-peer -peer trades on a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. Any form of money can become any other form of money. We support 355 payment methods, meaning someone can go and put in an Amazon code, Amazon gift card code they bought with cash into Paxful, turn it into Bitcoin. They can take that Bitcoin and sell it for an Xbox gift card or for a PayPal deposit Aww. or for a bank transfer in Cambodia or anything can become anything else. And when you give people that, especially the peoples of Africa, especially the peoples of Nigeria, I have to give them credit. The amount of hustle and business acumen, legendary. They took this open-ended um, uh, uh, Swiss army knife that we gave them and found a way to do everything with it, from remittance to payments to wealth no. preservation, everything. They, they taught us what the true use no. cases of Bitcoin actually are. Why? Because we listened, and that's why we're here. Beautifully said, man. Seriously, I, I, I feel like I could, I could go on with you for hours and hours and days and days. Uh, but it's so beautiful to see because it's really something it's hard for us to see those experiences and see the world from your eyes like that. So thank you so much for sharing that. And obviously, Bitcoin is a huge reason of why you came into this space. I love to ask you, you know, like a lot of people are talking about Bitcoin and then saying that smart contracts and, you know, second gen, third gen blockchains are the second biggest topic since Bitcoin and then DeFi. Uh, I would love to ask you on this evolution and how are you seeing things these days from uh, all the hype and all the, the news that's going around the world? Uh, well, OK, so I'm a serial <laughs> entrepreneur. I'm not some brainiac. I'm a guy who just tries really hard and listens. And what I can say about DeFi is they have managed to, to figure out a way to take away this bread and butter of Wall Street, which is this market making, right? Like 
So what market making is for someone that's never heard, you know, doesn't understand what the term means is it basically is, it's insurance against price collapse of your stock. They'll go to you and say, hey, OK, you want to put your you want to make your stock public? Cool. But what if no one wants to buy it? The price could just collapse out of nowhere. But will market make for you? Meaning they'll simulate trades on there just to make sure the price doesn't collapse through the roof in case trading ebbs and flows or just dulls naturally for a little while, right? That's it. It's basically insurance against price collapse. What these guys that did Uniswap did is they managed to figure out how to take that and turn it to 800 lines of smart contract code. Not just that, but you know, Wall Street would earn anywhere from 10 to 15% from that service. They found a way to take that money and actually give it to the people that are staking their tokens on that system. So they democratized Wall Street's bread and butter, which is the market making among just a bunch of blockchain token holders. It's called pooling, right? Yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. I mean, <laughs> I can't believe what they've actually done. Like Wall Street must be crying. It is they've created Wall Street on steroids. And if you look at what's happening there, You'll see people will take their Bitcoin or Ethereum and they will lend it out, put it up as collateral and borrow something else, Ethereum, let's say. And they'll take that Ethereum on another service and then they'll start farming all these tokens, right? Start pooling their assets, making money there, putting money. It turns into a massive, it, it, I can't follow it, right? It, it's almost as insane and, and labyrinth-like as a derivatives monstrosity in Wall Street. They've actually recreated that now on a blockchain. It's absolutely amazing. Now, the caveat is, is that 99.9% .9 of these tokens are complete and total rubbish. It's another scam on an order of magnitude greater than what happened in ICOs. But now the difference is, is that, you know, with ICOs, anyone could IPO. But with this, anyone can IPO and be a market maker. Be a market maker. This is the genius of it all. And this is why this technology will proliferate as a second layer above Bitcoin when this whole bubble bursts, which it might burst in a week or two or two or two months, whatever it might be. So let's just keep that in mind with all the sushi and kimchi madness that's going around. <laughs> there is real there is real technology behind this and is solving a real problem. And the problem is that why has why should Wall Street have the monopoly on market making? When now it can just be accomplished with a few lines of code and everyone can take part in the game just by staking their liquidity. It's brilliant. So is it fair to say that Uniswap is for you at least one of the most interesting innovations when it comes to the DeFi space? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this whole this whole method of, uh, you know, these vaults, these, these vaults. investment services that are packaged up nicely. I believe this fellow from South Africa, I forget his name, put that together. Yearn Finance, uh, right? Uh, what Yearn Finance did is... Andre, quite, Andre, right? Uh, I believe so, yeah. yeah. What Yearn Finance did was brilliant it, in that there was no pre-mine at all. He left all the money on the table. That's awesome. That's, so That's cool. why the price skyrocketed because like this is honest right here. It's brilliant. We can learn a lot from what's happening right now, but the real builders have to come in and take control. Everything that's happening right now has to be productized, has to be made, sim made simple for the mainstream user. And then things will start to happen. Then you'll get more legitimate projects that will last once this whole, you know, uh, charade collapses, because it will collapse. Right. And that's our job as product people. That's fantastic. So well put. And I agree with you, Uniswap. It's just incredible all the volume they're getting and all the people interested in this whole yield farming phenomenon where everyone's talking about it, right? At every bar, you know, in the crypto space. It's crazy, isn't it? It's amazing. <laughs> Ten guys working in the basement managed to put this together. And even Silicon Valley is throwing, I think, they got $12 million from Silicon Valley already, right? Now, Uniswap, well, Uniswap might not be what wins out ultimately in the end since there's going to be a lot of comers here. Uh, there's Uniswap and then the, a cl an exact clone came out right <laughs> after Moonswap or whatever it is. So it's going to be interesting to see what game mechanics people will pile on on top of this. Because if you look at it, it is a game. Yeah, it yeah, really is. And the game is. mechanics are very tight. Mm -hmm. So anyone here, if you're good at making games, if you're good at balancing out incentive and reward, this is the space to come into. Because after this thing collapses, I promise you, then the real business is going to be built up. Because now anyone can be a market maker. This is amazing, I have to admit. As someone that is very outspoken against speculation of any kind, I see it as a great toxic evil that has eaten away the fiber and fabric of the, the spine of humanity for the past hundred years, really since Jesus rolled around. Still, <laughs> this is amazing what's happening here. But speculation, you know, it, it's always going to be 
it's always going to be one of the first use cases, right? It, the gray markets are always the first use case of any technology. Silk Road and Bitcoin, we saw that. Now that's out of the picture. Now we're still in the speculative phase and it keeps having these roller coaster right bumps and humps, right? Our job is to take it beyond that to the five legitimate use cases, which are payments, remittance, wealth preservation, commerce, and my personal favorite, number seven, social good. If you've heard of Built with Bitcoin, that is our initiative to build 100 schools across Africa and the emerging world. We already finished school number three in Kenya. We're also building wells in every district in Africa. We're on well number two. It's an open initiative. You can go to builtwithbitcoin.org. You can make a donation. You can help us out. This is real. You know, I don't believe in charity. I, I never did. Uh, I was always um, kind of disgusted with how these people would say, you know, we're pledging all of our fortune to charity, but it's their own charity yeah, and it's only for their own interest. Yeah, and when you see what those people actually BS. do, like 5%, yeah. if, if they're lucky, gets to the actual people. It's BS to the max. It totally is, yeah. but we can, do it, we can do it better, you know, and we have been doing it better. 100% of what goes to Built with Bitcoin goes to actually helping the people. Water education and financial services, those three things, that's the trifecta of civilization trifecta. right here. And that's what we work on every single day. I made an oath with my co-founder. I said, we're not going to be like those jerks that, you know, they'll wait to throw a few bucks when they become billionaires, right? And they make it. No, we're going to make giving back a part of our for-profit company's mission from the jump. And I'm very proud to say that we are actually executing on that. And it's so beautiful from buying the house for your mom and then building schools, 100 schools and wells. It, that, that must be so rewarding for yourself, right? I, you're my model right now. I want to do the same thing for in my future life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So here's what happened. My mother got a divorce. She needs another house, you know, and this time I'm really going to hook mama up, man. It's all about taking care of your mom, right? So yeah. look at my, my story, right? My family had to pick up and leave their home. They didn't want to. A lot of people think all these immigrants just want to run off and move. So the people prefer to stay at home with their families. They don't want to go to a new place where they have to learn a completely new language, don't know anyone. That's scary, right? I picture a world where people don't have to leave their homes and their people and, their, uh, and go to someplace foreign and scary to make a living. People can make a living at home. People can make a living online. People can build their own financial services business in the sanctity of their own home in their own neighborhoods amongst their own people. Wouldn't that be amazing? That's actually what's happening now. I'll give you some examples. There's a guy in South Africa. He's a Paxful vendor. This guy built his own little version of Western Union on top of Paxful. And he did it in classic entrepreneurial style, right? He found the problem first. That's number one. As an entrepreneur, you first find a problem. The problem he found was Nigerian migrant workers who were working in South Africa, didn't have a bank account, didn't want one, just had cash, and they wanted to send money back home to Mama in Lagos in Nigeria. He went to them and he said, okay, Western Union's charging you 20%. It takes a day or two for the money to get there. Mama has to wait on a long line for six hours. I will cut their price in half and they'll get it the same day, maybe even instantly. All they had to do was deposit the cash in his bank account. He took that cash and his bank account turned into Bitcoin would sell the Bitcoin to some guy in Nigeria who would send the bank transfers to his mother, to those, to those uh, recipients. Boom, the deal is done. He found a same problem. He found a community and he set up a specific corridor and just iterated upon that. He has his own business. There's a girl in Kenya. She built her own version of PayPal on top of Paxful, focusing on, uh, I think it was cosmetics from South Africa to Kenya. But basically any you can build any financial services business in the world here because what you have is a finan is a universal translator, translator. for money. For it's money. absolutely the most amazing. Like, humanity has needed this for so long. We can't imagine how beneficial and world-changing this is in the West because we don't have yeah, problems that necessitate have the need problems, for yeah. something like this. This problem is actually overall 1,400 years old. Have you heard of Hawala? No. Hawala is this uh, Islamic system of money transfer, right? And it started, it started, um, it started a while ago, about 1,300 years ago, when the Roman Empire forbid agency, meaning all these traders that were going around moving carpets from Milan to uh, Casablanca and, and around, they couldn't collect money on behalf of anyone else. It had to be face to face. So what they did is they came up with a peer to peer system of money transfers based on a trust network. In, in, in this case, the trusted network was this uh, system of Islamic trust. It was kind of built on the, what some people call the first immutable blockchain, the, the last testament, the Quran. Now we have the blockchain. 
so we can extend this out to every faith, every religion, everyone can become a peer. At the end of the day, what Paxful and all these other peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces really do is they introduce you to an army of these magical money friends, right? That have a bank account or a PayPal account that they'll use to pay a bill for you or to collect money from you. And it's all one big happy family. Again, we have the technology now to recreate what happened in the past on a much broader level and to solve problems that will really change the world. Because once you allow money to flow freely, trade can actually happen and trade creates wealth call me crazy but i believe in a world where everyone can be wealthy in a world of abundance absolutely i do not believe in a world of scarcity where everyone is at each other's throats no that is a lie with all the technology we have with all this land on the planet and all these resources everyone can be provided for everyone can be wealthy i believe in this and the way to do it is to give people the ability to use their money that's it. Look at Africa. People think Africa's poor. No, there's tons of money in Africa, but it's trapped there. They just can't use it because their money is not as good as our money. Because the banking networks here don't honor their money. Because they put up a gate and the hole is this big and only so much can flow in. Because of these gatekeepers, we have poverty. Now, with cryptocurrency, with Bitcoin and all these amazing layer two technologies, we can do it. And the biggest technology, the biggest innovation is not anything on the blockchain. It's this people powered chain above the blockchain. Because only when it touches real humans can we bring in the real world of money and value into this. And that's the game changer. It's all about people. It's money, we're in the money business, but really it's the people business. Ah, oh, it's beautifully. Wow, I'm getting like goosebumps again, Ray. I, I really cannot see a better way to put this into perspective, but is this the definition of Finance 2.0 for you? It's this borderless, frictionless, inclusive money transmitter system. Is, is that really what Finance 2.0 is trying to achieve for us? And that's what the future is waiting us? Absolutely. What you do is you give every human being on the planet access to every financial network on the planet. I can do a bank transfer in any country in the world. Just yesterday, I paid for uh, a photo shoot. I'm designing my own clothes as well. Uh, in Estonia, I don't have an Estonian bank account, but I sold some Bitcoin to a guy over there and he paid her. And I do it here too to pay my rent here in London. I don't have an English bank account yet. And my bank account in New York, Bank of America, won't let me do a wire internationally unless I'm physically in the branch. This is a big shot American bank, Bank of America, and they're that ghetto. Believe that. Where do I do? I go into Paxful, I sell some Bitcoin, boom, the deal is done. Isn't that beautiful? I can access any bank account in the world or any financial network in the world. I was in China, I was charged, I had to, wanted to charge my phone at a kiosk. They took Alipay or WeChat. I didn't have Alipay or WeChat account. Went into Paxful, sold some Bitcoin, and the guy sent it for me. I gave him the QR code, done. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, that's amazing. That is so beautiful because it's, it makes people rich. Like, without that, people would not have a way. That's like the poor are used to paying more for financial services because the alternative is they won't be able to access that financial service at all or make that payment at all. But here, we can create a free market out of that. And then the free market dictates, okay? Some things will cost a lot. Some things will cost less, especially as the market grows. It's beautiful. That's how we create wealth. That's that easy. It's that easy. And for me, that was the breakthrough. All we need to do is just let people use the money that they have. And that's it. We'll all get wealthy. Wow. That's so wonderful, man. Ray, you've been dropping so many amazing gems today. And, and you know, obviously, so like Paxful has had tremendous growth. And I know that you guys are actually growing the teams as well. Yeah. I would love you to share like a message to the community. And, and what, what should we do to get involved with Paxful? Where should we follow you? Where should we get more information? It's, it's been an incredible journey in 2019, 2020. And I'm sure there's a lot to come as well. So it's all about talent, guys. You know, me and my co-founder, we have a burn the boats strategy. We're not going back. Like we're going all in here. We put everything, our heart and soul into Paxful because we are on a mission here. So no matter what, we're going to do this and we need talent to make it happen. So I'm calling the best people out there. If you, if you love what you do, if you love building, if you love people and you want to challenge, the biggest challenge there is, reach out to me personally. I'm Ray Paxful on Twitter. I'm Ray Paxful on Telegram. I'm Ray Paxful on Instagram. I'm Ray at Paxful.com. Find me, 
if you're if you've got business skills if you've got tech skills if you've got product skills especially we're product fanatics at paxful our second value is to build for people and that means product in addition to wells and schools we're all about product here we're product fanatics and our third value is it just simply be a hero that's what it is because what we're able to do right now is actually save lives. You know, it's like, remember the Justice League cartoon? I know yeah. it's old, I'm showing my age, but they'd be looking at this big old world map. They'd be Superman, Wonder yeah, Woman, yeah. Aquaman, the whole gang of them. Yeah. And this red blip would go off, blip, blip, blip. It's happening now. <laughs> yeah. Boom, huge deflationary crisis in Lebanon. People are losing their homes. People are starving. Massive inflationary crisis in Argentina. You know, that's, this whole banking network just went down here. Like, this is happening now in real time here. And at Paxful, we have that map in our office. Our marketing insights team is aware of all these calamities happening around the world. And we just don't have enough hands to help people. So wherever you are in the world, we need people on the ground. Reach out to me. If you're good, if you want to change things, this is your opportunity. I am officially shooting out the flare. We need help. Paxful wants you. Paxful needs you. We need the best to make this happen. So reach out to me. Find me. We're looking for a CTO. We're looking for a CMO. We're looking for a CHR. We're looking for the best business development people in the world. We're looking for great product people. We're looking for everyone. People that love building communities. Reach out to us. I promise you every little thing that you do will go immediately into changing the real world and you'll see it happen in real time. And to me, that is the most satisfying thing in the world. There is nothing better than that sense of accomplishment when you see something that you built, that you helped create, changing someone's life in real time. It's the greatest thrill in the world. I wouldn't give it up for anything. That sounds like an icky guy right there, the raison d'être, as we say in French, right? The real purpose in life. And, and you guys have heard it, right? If you really want to make change and be a part of this wonderful movement, Paxful, Ray Youssef here today, CEO of Paxful, and such an incredible bro, as we say, but at the same time, a great visionary and someone who's really driving for change. So if you guys can please share this video out to everybody, and if you want to get involved, we'll put all the links in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and blast that bell notification so that you can get access to these timeless interviews with tons of inspiring stories as we saw today. And we look forward to seeing you again next week, Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock UK time. See you next week, guys.